to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord in silence. Come into God's presence with singing. For the Lord is gracious, and God's love is everlasting. Come with full hearts and souls and minds. Let us worship God together.
God, love of the hearts that see you, light of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you. To turn, to turn from you is to fall, to turn to you is to rise, to abide in you is to stand fast together. We ask that as we come to you now, you grant us your grace and blessing. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Let us say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I would like to invite the children up for the children's moment. Hi, 
my name's Katie, and I go to Peace College. I'm a senior, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. Um, and I'm going to teach you guys how to say I love you in two different languages. Are you guys ready? Okay. You up for it? Okay. In German, you say, ich liebe dich. Can you guys say that? Great. And in sign language, all you have to do is this. Can you guys do that? Oh, wow, that's pretty cool, huh? Well, you know what? God, it's really easy to say I love you in different languages, isn't it? Right? Even in English, it's pretty easy to say I love you. Right. But the Bible study or the Bible story for today is saying that it's not, you can't just say I love you to people, that you actually have to show them. You see, after Jesus resurrected, so when he came back, You're right. That's absolutely right. That's what I was going to tell you. How'd you know that? <laughs> You've done it before. That's absolutely amazing. So you know the story, right? So Jesus comes back. He meets with the disciples, and he asks Peter three times. He says, do you love me? He says it, you know, not in German, though. He says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, all three times. And then after that, Jesus says, we're going to feed my sheep, which means to take care of everybody around us. Okay, so you already know that you, ha you just can't tell people, right? Yeah, but why do you guys think Jesus told, asked Peter three times if he loved him? Yes? Yeah, very good. Maybe see if he really meant it. Anyone else? Yeah, well, I think that Jesus asked him three times to show how important it was that we don't just love people and tell them that we love them, even though that is a great way, but also that we remember to show everybody that we love, not only the people around us, but also God. So how can you guys show that you love God and the people around you? What do you guys do? Are you nice to your brothers and sisters? No. <laughs> Are you nice to your friends? Yes, and to your families? And that's great ways to show that you love God and everybody around you, right? Just by being nice and cleaning your room, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, not cleaning your room. But being nice, right? Yeah. Okay, well, let's close in prayer. How does that sound? Good? Okay. Can you guys repeat after me? Dear God, thank you so much for loving each and every one of us. Help us show our love for others in all the actions that we do. Amen.
prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that in hearing we may also follow your way through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading today is from Psalm 63, 1 through 4. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. The word of God. The second reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the, and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said this to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The theme for this third Sunday in Easter, and might I add Peace College Sunday, is a love affair before breakfast, at, excuse me, a love affair at breakfast. And the guiding texts are, when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Please join with me in prayer. In the space of these next few moments, dear God, may your spirit speak a liberating word. In the words listened to of thoughts that are thought, and in all of the silence in between. Amen. So, where do we start this morning? With the love affair or breakfast? Well, I know where you all probably want to start, but my mother always told me to, it was best to begin the day with breakfast. And so I always do what my mother says, especially in church. Breakfast, they say, is the most important meal of the day. 
They, of course, being nutritional experts, diet gurus, morning talk shows, and yes, moms. They say if you eat the right kind of breakfast, you can increase weight loss potential, sharpen your mental capabilities, and you are led to believe you will become an overall better person in general. Who am I to argue with the experts? In fact, even the resurrected Christ felt breakfast was important. So much so, he fired up the grill to fix it for tired, hungry disciples who had been working all night long. Frankly, I must admit, breakfast is not my best event. I know, I know I should eat oatmeal and fruit, or bacon and eggs according to Dr. Atkins, but usually a veggie hot dog, ice cream sandwich, or leftover Chinese from the night before is the fare eaten in the fine dining atmosphere of my Honda wagon as I careen through traffic to make it to work in the morning. Again, Jesus saw this differently. Not only was breakfast important, but the atmosphere in which it was eaten was equally as important. Daybreak. On the sandy shores of Lake Galilee, the dewy chill of the morning and the undulating meditation of the fishing boat resting in the patter of waves, the crackling warmth of an open fire and the fragrance of warm bread baking and freshly caught fish grilling from the abundance of an inspired haul of the nets at the last minute. Breakfast on the beach. It sounds perfectly wonderful. And dare I say, romantic? It is the perfect setting for a love affair. But what kind of love affair is this? The disciples we know have seen the risen Christ at least once in this Gospel of John, and it appears since then they are not so sure as to what to do with their lives. So they return to their boats, to the baiting of hooks, the casting of nets, to the very things that put bread on the tables before they were called to follow a holy man who went and got himself killed. What could they do? Their lives had been turned upside down and back again. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you think you know. Something familiar, regular, rhythmic, and right. I hear that some people clean house. If you are a disciple, you fish. I can just see Peter standing on the shoreline, perhaps in grief, maybe anxious or uncertain, asking the giant life questions. Where does the journey go from here? Jesus has died. Jesus has risen. Where does that leave him? Where does that leave Peter? Gosh, he says to himself, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going fishing. The rest of the disciples seem almost relieved that someone has an idea, and they literally jump at the chance. Well, we'll go with you, Peter. And even though they fish all night, they don't catch a thing. Nothing. Now, some would say, well, you can't go back to your old, well, old life after being changed. You know, why on earth did Peter even think fishing was a good thing to do? It didn't seem like they were ever very successful at it anyway, even if, when you look at the first time we read about them fishing, at the beginning of the gospel. You can't go back to being ordinary you. However... I wonder if Peter was actually quite wise in his need to do something familiar. What's wrong with a little bit of work? It's not a bad idea to tr do something familiar, to give you time to think, to pray, to meditate, 
especially when life poses big questions. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist Vietnamese monk, encourages the practice of daily tasks to create a sense of mindfulness and meditation. If you are lucky, a tiny shred of enlightenment might break through as you work. Even when you are being the barista at Starbucks, dusting mini blinds, sorting junk mail, mowing the lawn, or careening through traffic. This daily practice can be a source of amazing connections to the Divine One, to the God of all creation. I think that's what happens to the disciples. They fish, they fish, they fish, they catch nothing. But instead of giving up after working hard all night, they decide to take the advice of a stranger on the beach who seems to know a little bit about fishing. And in their emptiness, they experience abundance. And they return to something familiar. They wait things out. They persevere, and something happens. The nets are full. And then they know, they know this stranger isn't just a friend, but their beloved Holy One, the one they have been missing, the one who took them on that crazy journey in the first place. And in Peter's typical enthusiasm, he leaps from the boat to swim to shore to meet Jesus. And then when they all are gathered on the shore, Jesus says, come and have breakfast. And the meal they share is not simply prepared from the hands and the stores of Jesus, but from the abundance of the hard, persevering work of the disciples themselves. The wondrousness of this breakfast on the beach is that the good, familiar comfort food of bread and fish is there because of the participation of all gathered. The Holy One is the one who makes this meal divine, sacramental, and love abides. Love is expressed, and indeed this is a love affair between Jesus and Peter at this breakfast. But what kind of love affair is this? Jesus asks Peter, not once, not twice, but three times, do you love me? And Peter responds each time with, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And by the third time, the question is raised. Peter has his feelings hurt. Who can blame him? Usually, when someone asks you if you love them and you say, yes, I love you, they usually will say back to you, I love you too. But Jesus doesn't do that. What kind of love affair is this? Upon a closer look, it is a love affair that is deeper and more intense than any of us care to admit. In this breaking of bread, Peter comes face to face with the crucified and risen Christ, and in a way he's facing his own death. He is utterly vulnerable and transparent. He has fallen down on his claims. He has offered to lay down his life for Jesus, and he fled at the hour of his death. Scholars say that this scene of threefold, de the scene of the threefold declaration of love gives Peter a chance to retract the three denials that he uttered during the arrest and trial of Jesus. Remember? Remember how Peter was questioned by soldiers who suspected that he had links to that holy man, Jesus? Oh, right, Peter. Where were your macho claims then? This breakfast becomes a confrontation of love. It gives Peter the opportunity not only to realize that Jesus has saw through him, but gives him the opportunity, yes, 
the opportunity to face the truth about himself. He is a traitor. But Jesus still sees him as one who can feed sheep. Jesus offers Peter the opportunity to forgive himself, to be healed, to be freed, to be able to continue on the journey. Jesus sees him as one who can feed the little sheep. In this breakfast, Peter is loved. He is loved by giving the opportunity to face his weakest self, to embrace it, to release it, and then to bask. Bask in the knowledge that the one who has known the pain of death and betrayal and the miracle of life trusts and knows that in spite of all of who Peter is, still believes that Peter has the capacity to nourish the sheep in the realm of God. What kind of love affair is this? It's a divine love affair. To be loved so much that even when one betrays the lover, you will not only be offered a sacramental breakfast of comfort food prepared by God's hands, but gives you the opportunity to confront yourself with the truth, to embrace your own weakest self, and in spite of it, the lover, the one who loves you, believes that you have what is needed to feed the flock. This is what happens when confrontation is surrounded by love. Dr. Yvonne Delk, one of the finest preachers in America today, talks about her moment of being confronted in love. Many years ago, she had stood in line to get into the Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco to hear Reverend Cecil Williams preach. Reverend Williams had taken a dying downtown church and helped it transform into a community that was literally open to all. When you walked into Glide's doors, diversity abounded in race, class, gay, straight, young, old. It was a people's church, and people from the street attended. Well, when she finally made it through the line, and got into the sanctuary, she took her place in a very, very crowded pew. She was sure that it couldn't fit another person. But to her disbelief and discomfort, a person was pushing through to sit down next to her, to squeeze in next to her in the pew. She couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. The person was dressed in women's clothes, and the person was carrying two shopping bags with possessions of the whole world in them. It was quite obvious that this person had been living on the streets. When the person sat down, their rolled down stockings revealed hairy legs. Well, Dr. Delk said that she tried not to stare at the face that revealed neither gender nor emotion. She tried not to notice them, and she tried to disappear into some personal meditation. The service progressed, and she was doing a really fine job of it, being focused on the preaching and the, and the singing and, and just enjoying being in the ambiance of, of a community such as Glide Memorial until... Reverend Williams asked the congregation to greet the person next to them with a holy kiss and a word of peace. Well, immediately she turned to her right, and that person had already turned to the person next to them. She looked to her left, and that person was standing. The person whom she couldn't figure out was a man or a woman who had been living on the street. She slowly faced the figure that was standing next to her. She closed her eyes 
and she reached out for the embrace. And slowly she felt the embrace come back to her. And the person's arms held her so tight that she could feel a heart beating and she could feel sobs racking the body. How long had it been since that person had been held? How long had it been since that person had been touched? But Dr. Delk writes, it wasn't about what happened to that person. It was about what happened to her in that moment. In that moment, she said she finally understood what being in the presence of a huge mystery was like. She understood what being in the presence of the risen Christ, of being held by Christ, was like. She understood what it was to be loved in spite of herself. Her personal, holier-than-thou posture had been pierced. She said she opened her eyes and looked into the face of Christ, who saw her as she really was, forgave her, and loved her. This was her love affair at breakfast. My friends, do you hear the waves on the shore? Do you hear the invitation, come to breakfast? When you hear the words, come and eat breakfast, will we risk to take the time for this important sacramental meal that may surprise us at any moment? What is the truth that you need to face in yourself? How is it that you need to be healed in order to embark on the next step of the journey? What are you being confronted with this morning? An unhealed quarrel with someone you love? A betrayal at work? A need for control? You fill in the blank. Allow yourself to face yourself in the presence of the risen Christ. How will you find the sheep to be tended to I know you know who they are. They graze in our lives every day, in the peripheries, at the margins, so vulnerable, so ready to be fed. They are in our prisons and in our schools, in our streets. They are the strangers we choose not to know or avoid. It might even be the person sitting next to you this morning. What kind of love affair is this? Come and have breakfast. I have no doubt that this may be the most important meal of your life. Thanks be to God. Amen.
God's people called to love one another, let us now pray for the needs of and thanksgivings of the church and of the whole world family. Dear God, this morning we are grateful for this day and for other days through which we experience the grace of being gathered in love with you and with your people. We are thankful for family and friends. We are thankful for words spoken to us today, which we want to keep in our minds. We are thankful for those we want to be close to, both near and far. We are thankful for words from God, which come through this community gathered. We are thankful for those who shape our vision and share our purpose. We pray for our earth home, that it may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and the air, soil, and waters be cleansed of poison. Remind each of us that this work begins with each of us. Move within each of our hearts to guide us to action that reflects your love. And we are thankful for Jesus Christ, who has come to, who has come to stay, and who has, to come, who has come to call us together Tomorrow, today, tomorrow, and forever, we pray this prayer and the unspoken prayers of our hearts in your loving spirit by praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is always a joy for me on behalf of all the members of our church family to extend a very cordial welcome to any of you who may be visitors in our midst this morning. We are grateful for your presence with us and we would encourage you to sign the friendship pad as it is passed down your pew so that we might come to know of your presence with us. If you are not actively affiliated with another Christian church in this community, we hope that you will give prayerful consideration in these coming days to joining with this congregation as we endeavor to worship and to serve our risen Lord. Today is a very special day in the life of this congregation for it is that day when each year we welcome uh, staff, faculty, uh, and alumni from Peace College, College to share in this worship experience with us. Peace College is a women's church related college which has a very significant relationship to the Presbyterian Church and especially to this particular congregation. We value this college because of its commitment to excellence and for the quality of its academic programs, staff, and students. We rejoice that we, as a congregation, can have a significant relationship to an institution that in considers the importance of the spiritual dimension of life very fundamental to a person's growth in character and conduct. It is a joy for us to welcome all of you who are here this morning to this service of worship. And we would especially like to welcome Laura Bingham who is providing this institution with some very creative, enthusiastic, and outstanding leadership. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Mosaic. I know as a congregation you know this, but it certainly deserves special recognition and mention this morning uh, that you do have a jewel in Leighton Mosaic. We are thrilled to have him join our Board of Trustees and most recently our Executive Committee of the Board on which Dr. Stock served for, for some 10 years. So your gain at First Presbyterian Church as its interim senior pastor is certainly also Peace College's gain. Indeed, it's been a pleasure for representatives of our student body and our alumni to join you this morning in the services of First Presbyterian Church. 
We do this as we conclude alumni weekend at the college where around 200 or so alums gathered in the past uh, Friday evening and Saturday to celebrate sisterhood and uh, the decades that bind us through the years. And we had alumni come from Oklahoma and St. Louis and last year I think we had an alum who also attended the church service uh, from the Netherlands. So we do reach out far and wide in many ways. But I always love on Sunday morning to imagine William Peace being particularly proud that these ties still bind us so beautifully in the early part of this 21st century. <coughs> Among the students participating in this morning's services are the presidents of the Student Government Association who led the children's moment and of the Phi Theta, Theta Kappa Honor Society, presidential scholars, and a host of talented members of the chamber singers and choir. The singers are led by Jim Smith and Jenny Vance, who are preparing for an exquisite European summer tour, starting rehearsal on the Monday after graduation and rehearsing for six days before launching to Europe. And they will uh, capstone their tour with a performance at Canterbury, at, at Canterbury Cathedral. And it is a treat for us at Peace to share organist Craig Barfield with you, who doubles as our fine vice president for finance and administration. It was wonderful yesterday. Uh, the class of 54 was celebrating its 50th reunion from their graduation of Peace, and Craig's older brother had been the crown bearer at May Court uh, in 1954. So they loved that thought, and we also discovered that Craig himself had been crown bearer for the class of 1956. So this is very important leverage for y'all to know about. At this time, I always like to welcome members of the congregation who have had or do have ties with peace, either through service on our various boards, our board of trustees, our foundation board of directors, our board of visitors, our alumni association, even our parents council. And as I look in the audience, I actually see parents of Paulette here today. Uh, and Paulette, did you know they were here <laughs> from, the, from the western part of the state? Um, and I'd like to ask all of you who have an association with peace in some way, including peace parents, uh, to please stand and let us say a spe special welcome and thank you to you. <laughs> Terrific. Wonderful to see you. Wonderful to see you. Ed Hip, in fact, joined me along with Dr. Al Edwards and Trent Raglan last week to present the college's highest award, the William Peace Medallion, to Perry and his wife, Dookie Sloan of Durham. And standing there with Ed Hip and Al Edwards and Trent Raglan, with Mr. Bill Ross on the phone because he couldn't join us, but he was certainly with us in voice and spirit, was quite a moment of celebration for us and for Peace College and the history of peace. One of our security guards drove us to Durham and yesterday he said to me, that was like history in the making, wasn't it? And I said, it sure was, Charles, it sure was. And Ed Hip would have been right there with us. I also want to acknowledge that Mary Bate Sherwood yesterday was awarded the uh, college's Distinguished Service Award. Uh, Mary Bates, I think I saw you earlier. Um, are you still with us, Mary Bates? Um, Mary Bates Sherwood for her long lasting contributions to the city of Raleigh, to education, and to Peace College. I also want to welcome a new uh, colleague, uh, senior, uh, I'm sorry to say senior minister, uh, senior administrator at Peace College, our new vice president for student enrollment, Doug Clark, joins us this morning. He has served for 10 years at Mary Baldwin College in Stanton, Virginia, and on June 1st becomes Peace College's new vice president for enrollment. Doug, would you stand a minute, please, and let us uh, welcome you officially to this congregation. And my parents are with us this morning, Marion and Charlie Carpenter from Kings Mountain. And mom and dad, if you'd like to stand, they're of course our best supporters in lots of ways. <laughs> it's also notable that the Vanguard Sunday School class asked my husband and the first man of Peace College, Warren, to be their guest speaker today in honor of their 100th celebration of their anniversary. And I know he didn't have any of his facts wrong because Sammy Downton has not been up here telling me he had any facts wrong. So Sammy, did he pass okay? With flying colors, wonderful. It was great for Warren to get to do that. As I listen and hear the sounds of the service this morning, I marvel at the lovely and inspiring message that Reverend Carla Miller had for us. Some of you may think that's the exception rather than the rule. 
But Carla's well is indeed very deep, and her ministry for all of us at Peace allows us to draw regularly from that well. Carla's duties as chaplain were really stretched this semester as the college experiences, experienced the death of two of our students in tragic car accidents, 35 days apart. As the campus grieved the loss of senior Katie O'Connell of Richmond and first year student Sally Clark of Charlotte, Reverend Miller gave refuge to our emotions and strength to our grief. So as you depart the service this morning, please extend a very special word of comfort and appreciation to Carla, Reverend Miller, for her care of the Peace Flock. Now some of you may have noticed that sign at the corner of Peace and Wilmington Streets where the former Newton stood at the edge of the Peace Campus. It simply says, Peace in Progress. One of the reporters for the Peace Times, our student newspapers, recently scheduled a long interview with me just to find out what this was all about. She asked me to define it, what it meant. Was there a committee that was a part of putting this together? Who served on the committee? What did it mean? She kept asking me all kinds of questions. Well, I immediately started listing off just what that meant. I thought all the various projects underway, such as the implementation of new majors for the college, this year in child development as a track toward teacher education, and in politics and public affairs. I talked about the renovation of Finley Residence Hall, which was built in 1963, which will include adding the porch balconies on it, complete with those iconic peace columns. That actually was the design for the two buildings that would flank Old Main from the 1920s. And when the building to the right was built east in the 1920s, those porch balconies was, were added. But New West, the building to the left, did not get built until the 1960s. It was called Finley, and the porches were never built. So as we're doing this total renovation of Finley, we're putting back those columns, which will be so beautiful and graceful for our campus. I started talking to this peacetime reporter about our new partnership with the U University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, for a complete seamless ad admission into their Masters of Teaching program. And we hope to do the same thing with East Carolina. Or even the design of a new residence hall that a committee has been hard at work build, uh, designing, which will be our first building on the uh, new property that we acquired and were in the paper so much about last year in 2003 as we closed those one block sections to bring that into our campus. Well, this student reporter looked a bit puzzled as I was rattling off all these things. So I finally paused and said to her, peace in progress is a state of mind and a state of thing. That's just it. We're a work in progress as the state's youngest, newest baccalaureate college, and we have evidence of that progress all around us. Two particular milestones I'd like for you to know about as you gather as a congregation this morning. The first, this year, final action on the elimination of our associate's degree program, effective with commencement 2005. The degree is in less demand by our students, and the college really needs to focus our resources in the competitive nature of the undergraduate colleges in North Carolina and beyond. The faculty unanimously endorsed this two years ago. It was anticipated in our strategic plan that we adopted in the year 2000, and our alumni association unanimously endorsed it through their board of directors um, some months ago. So after two to three years of this discussion, the trustees took final action on the elimination in January. The second milestone of this academic year, among many, is the remarkable student achievement and satisfaction marks Peace is receiving. Last year's graduating seniors ranked Peace number one in the nation among 649 liberal arts colleges and universities for an attribute called supportive campus environment. And the seniors listed piece in the top 1% of all these colleges in the nation for a category called meaningful faculty student interaction. These are indeed superlatives. There are many students and faculty members I could highlight in their individual achievements, but I want to mention two to you this morning. One, Christian Sinoff of Wilmington. Christian just took first 
and third places in North Carolina competition in musical theater, first, and in classical, number three, and when she competed in the Mid-Atlantic competition, she took third place among singers on the East Coast for musical theater. I'd like to ask Christian and her voice coach, Jim Smith, to stand and be recognized for that superlative. Jim and Christian. And senior Susanna Moon, with whom this congregation has a special relationship as her parents are missionaries in Bolivia. Susanna just placed first in North Carolina undergraduate sciences in a category called molecular biology and biotechnology. That's remarkable in and of itself as you imagine the number of colleges and research universities in North Carolina that teach undergraduate sciences. What is really remarkable is that for the third year in a row, a Peace College student has taken number one in molecular biology and biotechnology. I would say that number one, top 1%, top, top number one in the nation, and these superlatives really say a lot about Peace College today, the quality of our faculty, the quality of our academic programs, and the quality of our students, and specifically, their experience for four years and their success at the end of that four-year experience. And finally, I could stand here all day, there's so much happening at Peace to tell you about certain things, but I have to choose a couple of things. I want to tell you how fortunate I, I believe I am to be in a position this year as president of the Association of Presbyterian Colleges and Universities, representing 66 of the Presbyterian affiliated colleges all over the United States. We all are joined by a common purpose and a common mission, and it is indeed a privilege for me to serve in that capacity this coming year. Indeed, there are strong ties that bind us. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Let us continue our worship now as we bring our gifts to the Lord.
let us pray. Thank you, O Lord, for the faithfulness of your love and for the privilege of responding to your generosity with these our gifts. Receive now these our offerings and use them to heal the suffering, to shelter the homeless, to feed the hungry, to comfort the hurting, and to provide financial support for students in institutions like Pete's College. We give what we have in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Serve our Lord.